Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm John Schnepp, and this is episode 19 of Heroes. Here we are at the Collider Studios, and my guests today, we're, we're going to talk about superhero, super movies, TV shows, villains. Super movies! I'm so super excited. I'm here to get the words super. out. Right I can't the even talk. Movies. Look hey, look over here. We got John Campia, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, He's I'm drinking back. my super water. We also have Tiffany mm. Smith over here right back. I'm going to drink my super hot chocolate because I'm super awesome. And I'm trying to do Woo. the worst macho man Randy Savage in person. Nation ever made in the world. Of that was super, Randy. That, that's pretty pretty bad. Doing that sounds like Bill Cosby. <laughs> snap I into a actually. pudding pop. <laughs> snap no. into a pudding pop. All right, well, that's horrible. Yeah. Wait a minute. Come on over here. Oh yeah, I'm getting <laughs> that back. That was better. Now oh, it sounds yeah. like the Kool-Aid man. Yeah. No, now I'm channeling Christian <laughs> oh, Harloff. Yeah. Channeling. Oh yeah, I broke through a brick wall. I'm a giant jug of a juice. I'm high C on crack. Kool-Aid is really yeah. good. All right. Like What's our first one? Let's let's talk about Spider-Man. Oh what yeah. What are we doing here today? Oh, yeah. Spider-Man. Spider-Man has okay. got his writers. And they are the writers of the brand new Vacation movie, the Horrible Bosses 2 movie. Oh, I thought you were uh, saying it was horrible. I was the, like, no, the, no. The, the Vegas Magician the Vegas, movie. Uh, Burt Burt Wonderstone. Wonderstone. Yep. Uh, let's just talk about these guys. One of them was uh, from Freaks and Geeks, and now they're like, they're writers, they're directors, and Kevin Feige just gave them the keys to the Spider-Man first episode movie franchise. What do you guys think, Tiffany? This worries me a lot. Mm -hmm. Because they come out and they say he's going to be like geeky, awkward superhero, and I'm like, well, we've seen that before. That is who Superman, I mean, Spider-Man is, who Peter Parker is. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I'm like, I just, I don't need to see it again. So I don't know what, how you find that right balance of this is the character that we know and we need to keep some of that, but also making it fresh and new. The other weird part of it for me is a lot of their comedy is adult comedy. And so it's like, if you're going to do this kind of, we want it to be along the lines of like John Hughes, because they're saying, they mentioned Breakfast Club. Right. And I'm like, that could be really cool, but can they pull it off? Because I, I haven't heard anything great about Vacation, unfortunately. Right, John? Um, okay, so I was initially quite hopeful for it because despite the fact that, okay, we've had nerdy Peter Parker, I never really felt, as much as I like the Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies, I never really felt they got we got that Peter Parker. I, th I think we got the kind of a, the outcast a little bit. What about with Andrew Garfield? And then with Andrew Garfield, as much as I love the Amazing Spider-Man and what Andrew Garfield brought to it, he was a little too cool to be for Peter Parker. I still loved his incarnation of it, totally did. And one of the things we brought up on Movie Talk a few days ago, too, is where the first Sam Raimi Spider-Man, we had that slick talking one liner joking around Spider-Man when he was Spider-Man. Yeah. Right. But we didn't see that as Peter Parker. And one of the things these guys were talking about with Peter Parker is they wanted to bring that humor for him as a defense mechanism too. And I really like that approach. And I like the first horrible bosses very much. I was excited because I liked the first um Clyde with the Chance of Meatballs very much. And I didn't hate Bert I didn't hate Burt Wonderstone. Um, and I was really excited. This vacation movie looks awesome. Take all that enthusiasm, flush it down with the turd, because now that's gone. I realized they didn't work on the first Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Yeah. They work on the second Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, which I did not like nearly as much. Um, and now I am here. Well, I have not seen Vacation myself yet. Everybody, I've, I've known three people who've seen it, and they all tell me, they all tell me it's terrible. Now, I'm yeah. going to reserve judgment for myself, but now all of a sudden... Now I'm thinking about Horrible Bosses too. Now I'm thinking about the things about Burt Wonderstone that I didn't like. Now I'm thinking about Clyde with the Chance of Meatballs yeah. too. Suddenly now, that first Horrible Bosses is the lightning in a bottle, and I'm worried about it. Now, this is Sony's movie. Sony hired these guys. If it fails, I'm not going to blame Kevin Feige. <laughs> I'm gonna blame but he's the one they're saying approved this, that they came in and pitched an original story, an right. original script. And Feige was like, go for it. Well, yeah, he got on board with it, but ultimately this was Sony's final decision. They they agreed to it, and so I'll, I won't hold Kevin uh, responsible for this. But I'm going to hold on to the hope of what we talked about before. We all scratched our heads when they brought the Russo brothers on. Right. We all scratched our heads when they brought Peyton Reed on. We all, There's been a lot of these times, and... Kevin Feige, I mean, look, we all scratched our heads when they brought Mark Webb on at first. It's like the 500 Days of Summer's guy. I mean, that yeah. was a great little movie, but how is that Spider-Man? And look how that turned out for Sony. Look how those other examples worked out for Marvel. So I'm going to keep the faith, but my enthusiasm has dropped a bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this. Like, after thinking about it today, after reading some of those comments and hearing uh, Christian's, at least Christian's reaction to Vacation, I, I myself am looking forward to seeing Vacation you know, I might really enjoy it. I, again, I don't it's know. It's not the same humor. Like, no, I it, know. It's, it's finding that balance of saying Spider Man is such a 
across the ages recognizable character. It's not where about you're poo like, jokes and fart yeah, jokes. Well, not even, I mean, it could be poo and fart jokes, but like the adult humor that they are good at. Right. I just want Spider-Man. to see Spider Man rope some guy up with his web and go fart, you know, on a stage and go that'd be, ah, like that oh, would take me that'd be way horrible. Out of well, it. I, you know what I think though? All. I think this will be a, a case by case situation where they're going to turn in their first scrap, their first draft script. Yeah, and Kevin Feige's smart about this. He has a whole team of writers with him at Marvel who who do rewrites. Yeah, some uncredited rewrites. They're called polishes. I don't know if you guys know that teams of people are usually brought in and they're paid a certain amount of money to sit in a, in a round table type situation and fix the script. There's also the script doctors is another term that you might have heard. There's a one person will just come in and look, I just want you to focus only on this one character and bring an edge, bring a character, bring a three three dimensionalized this one character. Mm -hmm. They've been underwritten. So the script doctor will come in and just fix that one character. You'll also have like a team workshop where you'll have like, let's bounce it around. Let's get it going. Let's like, make some of these problem scenes, work them out. So that happens with every film, every big film it happens. So I'd be surprised if, if even these guys brought in a mediocre script and they didn't script doctor it a little bit and add it, you know, workshop it. The other thing, if it's a horrible script, they'll just be like, hey, they turned in their first draft. We got this other guy to do a polish on that and they'll announce it which means that guy's actually rewriting their script entirely when it's announced. Someone's going to do a polish <laughs> and it's announced. Yeah. If you don't hear about it, that you know what I'm saying? It's like there's all these different levels. So, But what if they do put, what if they like wowed everybody and they were like, look, we love Spider-Man. Forget about Burt Wonderstone. This is what we really want to do. Because when they pitched it, they pitched it as, them, as a writing and directing team. Yes, now, obviously they, they, they wanted to be the directors yeah, of this film as well. They hired yeah. this other guy, yeah. the top co top car or whatever, yeah. the, the, this unknown guy who I heard, you know, everyone's heard the movie's great. So that's why he got hired to do Spider-Man. So the, they're getting these guys. They must have had something that was like a wow factor for Kevin Feige to be like, all right, we're getting your, whatever your take on Spider-Man. Here's the problem that I have, though, with, with that argument. Trust me, I'm trying to use that argument on myself right now too. It's like the whole argument that people always come back with, with, well, somebody must have saw something. You can say that though about every bad screenwriter, every bad actor, every wrong director, everything that ever happened in the history of Hollywood. You could use that same argument. Well, somebody saw something that they liked, so there must be something good here. Um, no. That's not necessarily. No, but you can flip it. It's a glass half full, glass half empty. I know, half and I, I am desperately holding on to that. I'm on the other I side. I'm flipped. I'm like, look, they saw something good. Yeah. They're going to give these guys a chance, even be, even though they made Burt Wonderstone, is how I think. Even though they made <laughs> a steaming pile of crap so that wasn't funny. A team. It was like, it's not like I, I appreciate you saying, you know, I'm not going to blame Kevin Feige. I mean, yeah, Kevin Feige on this one, because it's like, it takes everyone. It takes the writers, the directors, the actors on set, the editors, the sound editing, everything coming together. Yeah. And and making something amazing. If you get on set and you're not getting the scenes that you need from the actors because the director's not connecting with them, then it's like, whose fault is that really? Do you blame the writers? I don't know. I mean, I still go back to, I liked Jupiter Ascending. I'm sorry. What? I know, hey, no, whatever. No, 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 I, I liked it that, too. I, I didn't I hate that, it. Yeah, there's stuff in it where it's like, you can see some moments, stop, stop, <laughs> where it's like, there was stuff that got cut out of right. a scene and it just ends up being this like big moment from one the of the characters. The last 30 minutes like, could have been cut. <laughs> yeah. We could have cut that part. But that's where I say it's like a team effort. So yeah. I'm holding out all my like real responses on this Both one. Both of you unacceptable. <laughs> unacceptable. Whatever. But Whatever. I'm, I'm going to focus on the first horrible bosses <laughs> and still blindly believe that this movie's going to be good. Well, look, I'm going to hold out. I, I suffered through Burt Wonderstone and Jim Carrey was fun. <laughs> so there's nuggets in everything. He there's was, nuggets in right. everything. Let's move on. Let's talk about television. Let's talk about Hawkman yes. getting involved in the Arrow <gasps> series and The Flash. Now, if y'all are Hawkman fans, you might have heard that Hawk Girl is going to be in League of League of Tomorrow, I believe it's called. Legend Legend Legends of Tomorrow. Tomorrow sorry. Legends of Tomorrow. Um, Legends of Tomorrow, which has got delayed. It's not coming out this year. Which it's will never happen, out. by the way. The show's never going to happen. It's, it's, they've already got the pilot. They're rocking forward. I know why John doesn't like this series all of a sudden. Dude. But they're bringing in the man from Thanagar. Let's talk about Hawkman. What do you think? Like, the, Let me just preface. We've seen him already Smallville. in Smallville. And those are the only... I've only seen four episodes of Smallville. And those I've two and are the ones... played by Michael Shank. Uh, Shanks. The, the, yep. the guy from Stargate. You want, and I, I thought he was great. I thought, I was thought he was amazing. really yeah. good Hawkman. Yeah. And Dr. Really Fate good. was in that. That's yep. a, I was like, Smallville, the finally, you're making me helmet. what? That's, yeah. That was it, man. Yep. So 
What do you think? I this is one of those things that I knew was coming because it's like you can't bring in Hawk Girl, you can't have Kendra involved if you're not gonna bring in Hawkman mm -hmm. somewhere. And then I started thinking, I was like, okay, so we're getting I thought you were gonna say you can't bring in Ken if you're not gonna bring in Barbie. That's, well, I, I don't mean, know why. Yeah, I went sure, there. you can go there, you can go there. Why? Um but it's also so if you don't know about these characters, it's they have an epic romance over five thousand years, they both die, get reincarnated. Hawkman always remembers and she doesn't, so he always has to find her to remind her of what the past was. So this is where I was like, huh, I wonder if there's a way that they could use that with Sarah Lance coming back because we're getting Black Canary turning into White Canary, but she died. So having this character come in to help kind of bring her into that world mm -hmm. could be really, really cool. And that's where we're hearing, we're not gonna initially see him possibly on Legends of Tomorrow, it'll be on Arrow first. Got it. Um, so I'm excited about this because I think th they're really the first different planetary metahumans that right. we're getting within the DC TV world. So having him come in and be like, hey, this is our story, and then being able to intro that and share it with Kendra as well could be really, really cool. Now you tell me, like, John, are you familiar with this as well? Because I haven't watched the television version shows of Arrow or Flash yet. That's my catch up, which I'm planning on doing, which is yeah. exciting because you say Flash is great. Flash so I'm very much looking yeah. forward to that. Now, do they touch on Thanagar? Is this is that part of this whole thing with no, Hawkman and Hawkgirl? Not as of yet. And to be honest, I don't know, and maybe you would. I have not heard, because maybe it wasn't the report and I just don't know about it yet, that they're saying Hawkman or Hawkgirl are actually from Thanagar. I haven't heard them say that They yet. haven't heard Thanagar, but they are saying that she is an, uh, an well, alien. Uh, not h human. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if they've actually even come out and said she's with. an alien, okay. but they definitely, they don't know a lot about her in any of the teaser trailers or anything that they've shown. Um, they don't talk about it. And the interesting thing was even at Comic-Con, because I think they were just going up to shoot, um, start shooting the pilot episode. Um, or start getting into the shooting because I was asking them. I was like, I asked the actress playing her. I was like, Do you know? Are you human? Or are you an alien? She's like, I don't know. <laughs> like they're no. not telling us stuff. They're kind of just revealing it as they get there. So um, we've never heard Danagar in okay. any incarnation on any of the TV shows or any indication for any kind of yeah for alien but stuff. But that doesn't that. mean that 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 he's not the intro to that. Right. right. You know. No. Exactly. And the other thing, it's funny because when you actually start thinking about Danagar and the story between Hawkman, Hawkgirl, and all that kind of stuff. I always instantly think of of Hancock. I think that's totally where Hancock got the yeah. their influence for oh, their yeah. basic underlying love story as well. I am really stoked about this because at first, I'm gonna tell you, I was I was really into Arrow, and when I heard they were doing a Flash spin-off show, I remember thinking, that's a terrible idea. <laughs> Flash, first of all, just a spin-off is a bad idea. Second of all, Flash is a bad character to do. I don't I did I like Flash in the comic books. I didn't think he would work on on television. I didn't. And lo and behold, now I even like Flash more than I like Daredevil. Wow! And I and, and you know how much I like Daredevil. Right. I binge watch that show in two days, and I think I like Flash more. That's how much I like that show. And so, so now man. I'm kind of excited to see about where they may go with bringing yet another character uh, into that, which is great. I have major apprehensions about Legends of Tomorrow. Um, it the trailer for it to me. Well, at first I felt a little bit of excitement. The more I watch, the more it feels like a Saturday Night Live skit. Uh, like no. a fake, like a fake commercial on Saturday Night Live or something like that. Um, so I don't know, but I will say this: my one of the things that really turned me off of Arrow was when they killed Canary mm -hmm. and bringing her the Sarah Canary, the true Canary. When if they bring her back, Katie Lotz, um, Katie Lotz who I thought was spectacular mm -hmm. in that show, bring her. I'd like to know how they're going to explain her being alive all of a sudden, but that's cool. Maybe there's I a mean, there's a little pit easy involved, guesses. Lazarus pit. Maybe there's a little <laughs> pit involved. I don't even know if it's that. There's time. We know yeah, that there's right. time travel I involved like yeah. at this the, point. The dude from Prison Break, uh, who plays Captain Cold. Wentworth mm -hmm. Miller. Uh, Wentworth Miller. I really like him in yeah. Flash. And actually, I'm a little bit pissed off that that means we're probably not going to see him in Flash all that much. So, so that bothers me. But there's, there are elements that I'm excited about. But I have this gnawing feeling that I had with the Halo movie. When the Halo movie and Peter Jackson was producing Neil Block, I just had this rotten feeling. I don't think this movie's going to happen. This show is I happening. I don't think this show is going to happen. Well, I think you guys are both. I hope it does. You guys are both wrong. No, I don't know. <laughs> how can we both be wrong? No, I, I think it can't be. No, I think it is happening, but what yeah. they are doing, how you're both wrong, is they are retooling it. Remember, they made a pilot. We've seen clips from that pilot, but yep. they are reshooting large portions of that pilot. That's why they went back to, not to the entire drawing board. They're not like recasting, but they're refiguring out a better way to do this time travel, time jumping series. Well, and the thing that I enjoyed about it is that when initially I heard about it, I was like, another spinoff with a team of them? How's this going to work? But the actors that they've chosen are all actors that I think 
on the shows that they've first appeared on, you can see how excited they are and how much fun they're having playing yeah. these characters. And so getting a team up of those actors, like Victor Garber, I mean, talking to him about the character that he plays and even Wentworth and Dominic Purcell, where it's like both of them were like, yeah, I mean, I never thought we would get to work together again if it wasn't prison break. And we're so excited. So getting all of that together where it's like, lightning in a bottle of right. all these actors that get along that are excited to be there with great writers and some pretty epic like special effects and stuff. Yeah. I'm so on board for it and I'll not just because I work for DC. Well, no, I'll best. say this. I did like during right before I think it was before the here, the Masters of the Web panel, there was right. like I was cuz I didn't get to any panels at yeah. Comic-Con. I had my own booth and sweating and doing all this other crazy madness. Um, but I did kind of like half sneak into the end of the Legends of Tomorrow yeah. panel where they showed this like big trailer and I got to see this like action scene with them fighting and flying yeah. around yeah. and stuff and it was fantastic really cool special effects they weren't skimping Crazy it's not like a TV. TV special effects felt like a movie scene so I was impressed by that and I was like all right well I'll I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it when it comes out I think they're going to have to if it does happen I think one of the things they're gonna have to do though is be very generous with their um, Arrow and Flash cameos. I think they're going to have to because these right. are these are secondary characters in shows that, as awesome as they are, aren't ratings giant shows. So you're going to have to be generous, I think, in bringing in Oliver, bringing in Barry from time to time to to draw to bring in the audience to join in with them. Well, yeah. in the other direction, because I think there were already stuff posted on Instagram. They're they're shooting the Flash again already, and Wentworth and Dominic were on set. Right so you right. know you're getting Captain Cold and Heat Wave, and they're going to have to explain some of the Firestorm stuff on the other shows. So I think there will definitely be great crossover. I mean, we already saw it with Flash and Arrow and how well that worked. So I'm not worried about the crossovers happening. I think it will for sure. Right. Yeah, in fact, that's what I want to have happen because yeah. that yeah. makes it feel like a bigger universe. Yeah. Let's Next it'll on. be a crossover with iZombie somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's even possible, right? It would the, be cool, We though. can't go into the Vertigo universe. We are. Your Flash is running really quick or whatever. Yep. We'll figure it out. <laughs> All right, number three, we're going to the X-Men universe fox the x-men apocalypse world is expanding and we saw like this this week brian singer loves posting pictures on instagram he posted a picture of him really tiny standing next to a giant anubis apocalypse looking egyptian something so <laughs> and he just said in, in his in, in his instagram tweet he was like not everything's green screen or he like did a bunch of hashtags which is cool which i yeah. love seeing practical sets it's that's the great thing about films when you go see and you're like that doesn't feel fake because it's actually really there. Yeah. What do you think, John? What about well, the these pictures? First thing that came to mind when when we saw this, let's get a shot. Where, oh no, that's a that's a different picture. Um, let, can we bring up actually that image one more time? The one on on the main screen here, that uh, the one that we got. Oh, the you. very first, the one that's behind me now. The very first thing I thought of when I saw that one of Brian Singer live with the statue, I thought, "Holy crap! It's the Well of Souls." Yes. And that that looks yeah. like it's straight out of Raiders of the Lost yeah. Ark, and he I'm expecting. It back. Yeah, he did. Did he yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. He I'm, ex Raiders of Lost I'm expecting yeah. Indiana Jones come swinging by and kick that statue through a wall. Totally. Yeah. Um, I think it looks spectacular. My, I, I honestly cannot describe my enthusiasm for this. I was so excited when they first mentioned Apocalypse, seeing that they're going to stay true to the Egyptian roots, mm -hmm. the true En Sabanur kind of stuff mm -hmm. as well. Is my but you know he's not trying to mislead us and think oh this is all gonna be practical we'll see giant green screen sure. stuff going on we, I think look what Brian Brian Singer has never turned in anything less than an excellent X Men movie right. he's given us three excellent X Men films I have no doubt this one even if it's you know Ivan Ooze is Apocalypse right now whatever I still have no doubt it's gonna work on screen and it's gonna be awesome I really love these images what do you think I think it's cool because I'm wondering what aspect of Apocalypse's story we're gonna get. Mm. Are we gonna see him like younger, kind of coming into his own and taking over and destroying the Pharaoh of the time and realizing what his power is because there's a fun love story that's involved as well that we could possibly see some stuff with? Um, or is this gonna be like him returning to his roots and saying, okay, yeah, I learned who I really am and this is the destruction that I can do? Because that photo in the background mm. where it's like with Singer walking around, you're like, uh, that's yeah. like destruction that only Apocalypse could do. Right. Um, so I love it. I think it's really, really cool. And I, I want some more of that background because I think this is a character that a lot of people who aren't necessarily as versed in the comics aren't gonna quite understand and learning that you know, what really fuels him is survival of the fittest. Mm -hmm. And so he is one of the first mutants ever of all time. And so it's like him coming in and knowing where he grew up from and to become that person. And then that, that will fuel his connection with Magneto. 
I'm I'm psyched. Yeah, I think he's the one who t who tops Magneto and is like, we're the superior yeah. race. <laughs> yeah. Like Magneto yeah. always had that, and then this guy showed up. He's yeah. like, oh wait, you know. I think they're gonna go with the, the latter. They're gonna they're gonna have wake him, him up. Back. Yeah, he's gonna be like, I've been snoozing like a vampire. What have you done to my planet? Type of a thing. So, you know, either way they do it, they might have a flashback yeah. scenario because they already established him in X Men Days of, of Future Past at the end during Egypt in the Egyptian yeah. time. So yep. there'll be some some kind of correlation as we can see. There'll be something there, but very excited about this. Uh, let's move on to number 4. We're talking about Ant-Man. Ant-Man, Ant-Man. He's Ant-Man's staying on, on on everybody's brain right now. He's like the second weekend in a row, number 1 box office. Let's talk about all things Ant-Man. Uh, we've got uh without going into spoiler territory, uh we're going to talk for a few minutes about, you know, some story points. Um, but first, we're gonna we're gonna drop some uh, pictures that have shown up online. Mm -hmm. We've seen the wasp outfit, so yep. that's been uh, that's been traveling all around. We know that the wasp is in it. So anybody who, post credit who, uh, scene, yeah. if you haven't if you haven't heard about this, you're not online, so you couldn't possibly <laughs> even be watching the show. <laughs> so I don't feel bad about it. Um, we also heard uh, Sebastian Shaw talking about his scene. He's the Winter Soldier. He's also in the Ant Man. Movie yeah, that would be Sebastian Stan. Stan. Sebastian oh, I'm sorry. Stan. I'm Sebastian you're thinking about the from the X-Men. Yes, you're thinking about the, the, the Hellfire, Hellfire Club. Hellfire Club. <laughs> That's who I'm yeah. thinking about. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about X-Men again. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I so, called yeah, Spider-Man Superman, Superman yeah. earlier. So. Yeah. <laughs> Fans go nuts. Go crazy because I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, So we, he's in an end credit scene. A lot of people have heard about that. We're not going to spoil it just yet, except you've probably heard about this. Once, once again, you're on the internet watching this, so you must have heard about this. Um, Also, let's address that little special something. that Remember, we were talking about that last week, and you were like, you, you hadn't seen it, but I was like, you know, I heard that there's something in that little microverse pocket shrinking scene. I didn't Did know. I don't. It? I don't know this. I didn't see it what either. What is it? So I, let's, I didn't see it either. Let me give a five five second count. You can skip forward. I this don't want to ruin stuff hands. for people. Yeah, five, four, three. You better not be here. When two, get going. Move forward. One. Here we go. So we're gonna talk <laughs> about. That Ant Man scene where he's shrinking into the subatomic, you know, remember? Yeah, my ghost subatomic, yeah. Hank Pym is like, look, that's how I lost my wife. Yep. These are things that you, you can't cannot, come back. You can't do this. And he has to do this to stop the, the villain. So it's sort of one of those things where he's like, he's shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. Incredible special effects. I mean, some of the most jaw dropping, amazing scenes. I was like, I'm in a kaleidoscope. <laughs> yeah, literally. It was beautiful. Yeah, I felt great. like I was yeah. tripping on acid again. <laughs> and uh, it was one of those things where someone somehow saw something. And I was like, what What are you talking about? I read it online. They, they saw, I, I saw the wasp, or I saw something. And then Peyton Reed went ahead last week or a couple days ago and said, yeah. There's someone in there with Ant Man. There's I mean, a quick I, well, you'd assume that it's it's Janet. Janet. I, here's the problem I have. For if if this is true, then they contradict themselves a lot. But here's the other How? thing. I don't know if it's Janet. Could it be Eternity? Well, see, so here's here's the problem that I'm that I'm having with this is I after we first talked about this, Dennis and I and Wendy we went to go see Ant Man again, mm -hmm. and you watched very closely. and I, I I was going to watch really closely for that. Right. And so I've I've watched some stills. I look. I still don't see it now. Let's say it is there. Right. I've got a couple of problems with it. Um, part problem number one: if it's Janet, okay, you're supposed to continuously shrink for all eternity. Um, so, like we saw him, he, he gets gets the size of a of this and size of this, and he gets smaller than the atom itself, and he, he keeps going. He mm -hmm. just keeps going. Right. And so, and also, um, it it doesn't transport him to an uh, to an alternate dimension. He's still in there in the room. Why, how would Janet be there in that bedroom? Maybe she figured out how to stop herself from shrinking Maybe, in a but similar here's way as problem. he figured out how to get out. Here's the other problem I have. The whole problem with the whole subatomic thing, what does the PIM particle do? He explains this to Scott. I found a way, he said, to shorten the distance between atoms. That's the key to his shrinking technology. I can take all your atoms, which float like they mm -hmm. said this part, and I can bring the atoms together. How then does he get smaller than an atom? Like, Pym's particle doesn't shrink atoms, it shrinks the distance between atoms. How did that all happen? So that whole thing brought up this big collage of question marks for sure. me mm -hmm. that I haven't found answers, but bottom line, saw the scene again, still didn't see it. Right. That doesn't mean it's not there. I, I just still don't see it. And I'm it. not going to jerk out and be like, well, because it's all fake make-believe, John. Yeah. It doesn't have yeah. to make sense. That's an easy cop-out. Yeah. If, if you're trying to do pseudoscience, like I've seen like the breakaway sections of Godzilla, how he breathes fire. Some weird nerd came, this is how it works. A combination of this and then a scratching mechanism. Whatever. Somebody cool figured it crap. out. Yeah, someone figured it out so it makes 
some kind of faux scientific, scientific sense. sense, maybe. Same thing with this, like, oh, I'm shrinking atoms, I'm doing this and that. Granted, it doesn't make sense. How could Janet be there if she it happened somewhere else? All I could figure out is that like they're gonna try to tie this in with like a Doctor Strange type of as you shrink, once you shrink to a certain point, you've entered some kind of other dimension. Yeah. Which then time and space correlations don't count. Yeah. Or whatever. That's the only thing I could figure out, you know. And even I, that's hard to I you. can smell the sweaty. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> the, the direction that is, going here. That is Doctor Strange universe. So if in if it is in fact eternity, I'm gonna, when I see it again, I'm gonna look for that shape the the eternity yeah. character, the Steve Ditko eternity. So we'll see. I don't know. Maybe it'll pop up in like some weird extra on the DVD or Blu-ray, you know. So, but anyway, what did you think about Sebastian Stan's comments? Uh, what were his comments again? Yeah. He was just talking about like, so he shows up at the end in like yeah. this crazy arm vice, right? Yeah. And Captain America and the Falcon are like, yo, so what are we going to do about this situation, right? And he's like, and Falcon's like, I know somebody. Bam, Ant-Man will return. I know a guy. Yeah, I know a guy. He also looks so different. It look, took me a second to register think? who it was. Yeah. I, I didn't think he so. He looked so different to me. And I think it's because also, the, I mean, they're going to have to show us how they end up getting him because the end of the yes. other film... He at the end of Winter Soldier, yeah. he's out on his own figuring out what's going on with him. He goes to the museum, yeah, and it's not he's and not. And in captured. Ultron, they're still looking for him. Sure. Yeah. In Ultron. So all I can surmise is that this sequence that we're seeing at the end of Ant Man is really early in the beginning of Civil War, and that perhaps Captain America and Falcon have nothing to do with him getting caught. Hmm. That's my that's my guess is that. He's I think in this their weird. Trap. I think it's went, their trap yeah. form. I think yeah. it's, their it's a trap weird form. arm vice. Like I'm like, did Iron Man put him in that? Somebody had to. Well, Captain. They know super he strong. loved cookies. <laughs> Bucky <laughs> loved cookies, and they put it at the back of that vice. He reached <laughs> it. Oh yeah. no! Caught foiled. again. <laughs> yes. Well, we'll find out soon enough with that one. So, uh, do you guys want to talk about a uh, wasp suit? Yeah, I let, I thought this suit looked awesome, and I know there's some people who are saying like, oh, it looks like it's not that cool. It's kind of retro. I don't like the cone on the head. I'm like, that's kind of the first appearance of the wasp suit. It looked kind of like that with mm -hmm. way more pronounced like pointy head. But he's also, Hank's also talking about it. And he's like, this is what I was working on with your mom. This isn't the final one. And he's right. like, we were, I realized we're building it for you and let's work on it together. So this is the first incarnation of right. the suit without having Hope work on it at all. Right. So I think it looks pretty cool yeah. for like an old retro costume that they're just putting together. Yeah. That's what I was sc screaming at a friend of mine who was complaining about. It's like, why does it still look like the old Ant-Man suit? Because him and his wife were working on it together <laughs> right. back in the early 80s. Yeah. That's right. That's why it yeah. looks that way. That's so it totally it's makes 80s sense. 80s looking yeah. maybe. Yeah, you know? I, I really dug it. And you know what? I was one of these guys at the start of this whole thing. I did not want Evangeline Lilly to end up being Wasp. Oh my God. And I was so happy when I saw the Hank the Hanks flashback. It's like, oh, there was Wasp and now she's gone. But by the end of the film, mm -hmm. I was starting to, man, maybe it would be cool if she was Wasp. And then they hit you with that end credit scene. It's like, yeah, I'm on yeah. board. This right. works. And I mean, let's be honest, Tony Stark hasn't had a chance to make their costumes look cool yet, which he says in right. the Avengers. He's Hank like, I make it look him. cool. I know. Hank, Hank, will, Hank him will not let a Stark <laughs> touch yeah. these uh, outfits. Him and Stark has some issues. <laughs> yeah. That's in the movie. So he you doesn't know. he doesn't like to share. No, no, he doesn't. But I'm sure I, and I was very happy to see Evangeline Lilly that she is gonna be the wasp because yeah. she's awesome and she's so she, great in Ant Man. So. She was awesome, and that's still one of my favorite scenes where <laughs> she's teaching him how to punch. It's so oh, it's good. Great it's yeah. so good. I loved it. All right, let's move on. We've got Fantastic Four opening in literally a, like a week and a half. We've got the last two spots, which really showcase a lot of action sequences as well as Doctor Doom. So, you know, change is coming. Here's Doom. Dude, what, do you, what do you think? I'm still so on the fence about this because I don't quite understand what they're going to do with Doom. I'm like, Victor Von Doom, Doctor Doom. No, just... Doom, Victor Doma, what is his, well, who is this? <laughs> um, and you see that shot of him and you're like, oh, that's the character that I know, but we've only really heard that he's a hacker and that his code name is Doom. So right. it's interesting to me because I don't quite know what we're going to get in this one, which is actually kind of exciting to me because I trust Toby Kebbell as an actor. Um, so I'm really excited if, to see what he does with this character. I maintain my enthusiasm. I think this movie, I'm very excited about it. I trust every actor in this film, all of them. These are all mm -hmm. great 
talents. I still trust the screenwriter. I still trust the director. I've liked the trailers that I've seen. I had actually, it's funny you mentioned that. I had an argument with my saying, I don't know, man. They just haven't shown us enough of Doom. It's like, you know what? Y'all complain and cry and whine when they show you too much of something. And now when they're really holding a lot back, you're like, they're not showing us enough. It's like, yeah. no, I can't make, make up my mind. They haven't shown me mind. enough. Yeah. The one thing, though, that is dampering my enthusiasm right now is that Fox has still not screened this movie for anybody. We're a week and a half away. Yeah. The first screenings are coming two days before the official release mm -hmm. date of the movie. To me, it, on the surface, because remember, I'm excited about the movie. I think the trailers look great. I believe in these filmmakers. I believe in these actors. Fox is sending up a signal right now. We don't believe in this movie. That's what Fox is saying right now. Whether that's their intention to say it or not, the message they are sending the audience right now is we don't even believe in our own film and we are going to hide this movie as long as we Just can. Just unsure of what the reaction... I mean, it could be as simple as we're unsure of how fans are going to react to this. We're unsure of how the audiences are going to see this. So let's just hold it back until right before and then everyone can go see it on their own because that's kind of... I mean, we saw Mission Impossible last night and it was like they were like, Feel free to post whatever you want, your reactions on social media, and that's when you know that they're pretty confident in this movie. Right. And so in this case, it's like, well, you can post what you want, but it's probably, I don't know, with, at least it's only like a day or two well, and everyone can go and see it themselves. We're leaving here. We yeah. are leaving, as soon as we're done shooting here, we are leaving to go watch a screening of Goosebumps. Right. Three months in advance. Yeah, very excited about that. That screams to me, yes. yeah. we believe in this film so much, we're going to let you see this thing now. Right. Like, that's that screams confidence to yeah. me. Yeah. Well, here's, I'll, I'll put it this way, like, Mission Impossible, you, you just saw it yesterday, but it comes out in two days, or re literally like two days, so... But they showed us audiences like weeks ago too. They're like like well, Frosty, our buddy Frosty had in, yeah. In they premiered a long time ago. They invited some press down to go watch it there. So, like while they're doing the the final push now, we right. can advance. They have been showing this to audiences prior. And, this, to and granted, this this film was like pushed up six months. So they're yes, like, yes, that's the other thing to keep. In we mind. need you know, we, hey, it's coming out because it's still shocking to me yeah. that it's coming out. I'm like, ah oh, man, I can't wait to see Rogue Nation. I could see it in three days. Yeah, you just saw it. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. I've been waiting. I've been, I loved Ghost Protocol. So. But to talk about Fantastic Four, the trailers and, and everything that I've seen really feels like to me, it still feels like it's a great horror sci-fi superhero yep. film. So if it captures that, which is what the original Fantastic Four really is about, it's about a group of people who get turned into monsters yeah. who have to fight other monsters. It's like the original Marvel superhero universe. That's how it started with a bunch of monsters. Yeah. So it's sort of like, I want that to, I really want that to be the feeling of this film. I feel like that's what it's going to be. I don't know if Fox understands that. I, I just I, I question whether the people in charge of Fox know what they have. Well, I th yeah. The thing that excites me about it, too, is the fact that we know this is based off of a more recent version of the Fantastic Four. This isn't right. gamma rays changing them. Right. This is interdimensional travel that creates them into these characters that we know, which I think is really interesting and cool. I'm hoping that... And don't quite know how they're going to explain this stuff, but I hope that we get some stuff into explaining what the negative zone is right. and you know how they actually become who they are. I don't know how how sweaty they're going to get in this one. I'll <laughs> say this. Also, yeah. I'll say this. Despite the fact that Fox seems to be trying very hard to convince me I shouldn't like this movie, I am going into Fantastic Four with high hopes. I'm I with really you on am. that. I'm going Same in here. with high hopes. So let's. Uh, hopefully, you guys are going to check out Fantastic Four. I'm pretty sure it's not going to be like the other two. Yeah, it's so, got to be better than the that's other That's my two. guess. Captain America's so, not in it, and yeah. there's no blonde Jessica right. Alba. So, yeah, so hey, we're already winning. Right, it's already kind of a win situation. <laughs> Let's go into the thing that I like to call minor mutations. We're going to list off some crazy news of the week, and then we're just going to pick and choose what we want to talk about. Number one on minor mutations, we've got Deadpool trailer rating. It's finally in. It's going to be a, P a PG rating, just so they can show it with everybody, all the other things. So I don't think it's going to be the R-rated one. That trailer. Leaves the trailer. Yeah, the trailer. Yes. We're talking yeah, about yeah, the yeah. Talking about the, the movie is like, rated I R. Don't movie. Know. Oh, God, no, the really movie is going to be hard yes. R, but this this trailer they're yeah. going to be like, look, so everybody can see it, and then they're probably going to release a, a red band one. Absolutely, yeah. band, so. that's weird to me because yeah. why are you going to show a PG thirteen trailer and get kids who are going to want to see this? 
it's not about the kids. It's about the the people who have kids and or just uh, at that age group that can see an already. Well, here's the other thing: Fantastic Four, right? Yeah. Fantastic Four. You can't show a red band trailer in front of Fantastic right. Four, but there are a lot of people seeing Fantastic oh, okay. Four that you're yeah, going to want to get to come true. see Deadpool. Yeah. So that's you got to. Yeah, it just limits right. your audience when you when you have a red band trailer. You it's so limited. So yeah, they're like, true. look, let's unlimit it. So. Uh, there's also a behind-the-scenes picture of, of Deadpool with some blades. Uh, number two, we got Batman and Superman, another behind-the-scenes picture of those guys hanging out. And, and, you know, come on. The trailer was incredible. I cannot wait for this movie. Yeah. Well, of course, we have to wait. What is it, another seven months? Ugh. It's really not that long, though. <laughs> you know, we got a movie called Star Wars that we could see yeah. a million times before that. It's so true. Um, I can't wait for this film. So anytime they drop anything, I especially like the Lex Corp oh, picture man. of uh, Jesse Eisenberg, you know, like hanging out in a giant like, basketball court. The with, most know. colorful thing we've ever seen from Zack Snyder. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. And it's Lex Luthor. Yeah, so yeah. it's definitely, we definitely now know that this Lex Luthor is definitely like the Facebook kid meets Google. So, you know, with, yeah. a, with a demented side. Well, and I think, it, it, I don't, I have no idea, but I have this feeling that it's like he, Lex Luthor is putting on a front for everyone. That's not who he really is. He's doing stuff under the surface. And so there's part of me that's like, I know everyone's talking about the hair. I would not be surprised if this is a wig that Lex Luthor is wearing. Gee, in the who movie. has done that before? Gene Hackman <laughs> yeah. did the exact same yeah. thing. I was with gonna Lex say, Luther. Tiffany, I think you're stretching it where you're saying Lex Luthor is not who he's pretending to be. Hang yeah. on a second. Yeah. All right, well, let's talk about Stan Lee. He's getting uh, sweaty talking about the human torch and casting a uh, person who was is not white. So he's talking about that. <laughs> I think it's I think the casting of uh Michael B. Michael, Jordan. Michael Jordan, B. Jordan is incredible. And I love the idea yeah. that the human torch is black. What do you guys think? I love the fact that Stan Lee wrote a letter to the director because Michael B. Jordan talks about it. Stan comes out and says, yeah, I totally support it. It's cool. Like, this is a new time. I wrote this character so long ago. And at the time, fine, he was white. Now he's not. Um, but that he wrote to the director being like, I'm on board. This is cool. And Michael B. Jordan was like, if Stan Lee, who created the character, says he's cool with this, then let's move forward with it. It's, it is for a contemporary time, we live in a much more diverse world, so why not have this character in there? I mean, right. it doesn't it doesn't take away from the actual character. I think it's sometimes when it's, if there was something to be said, why this character, it's important that they're a white person, then that's one thing. Like, I mean, it's like I talked about with Exodus, where I was like, it's kind of important that these characters are this specific race in some way. Um, this one doesn't bother me at all, though. I'm like, it's fine, whatever. She's I adopted. Yeah, I here's the thing. When when I get asked the question, should they have made Johnny Storm black? The answer is no. Should they have kept Johnny Storm white? The answer is again, no. Mm. I don't care. I don't care. Is being white or black a key essential element to who the character of Johnny Storm is? No, it's not. It's it that that mm -hmm. when you look at the if you just look at Johnny Storm on paper, does anything in there read scream out, this dude's got to be Caucasian? It, it doesn't. If it did, I might feel differently. Yep. Right. But guess what? Black Panther, he need to be black. That's a key core essential element to who he is. If you read on page, who is Black Panther? Well, then you know, oh yeah, this, this dude needs to be African-American. This, need, needs, this dude comes from Wakanda. Right. So yes, that has to be. This doesn't. So they went out and got a great, mm -hmm. world-class, one of the best up-and-coming actors in the world today, right. loaded with talent to add to their movie, and they worked out the stories thing by saying they're adopted. Now, do I personally then kind of wish they had gone one step further then and got a Black Sioux Storm? Yeah, I kind of do. I would have liked it if they were, you know, siblings from the same parents but there didn't so whatever it's not a key essential element to who the character is so mm -hmm. i don't care and neither should you yeah yep good well well said let's talk about the last nugget for minor mutations which i'm extra excited about mark hamill is playing the joker again <laughs> in the killing joke has well, it Alan come out Moore, officially it's official is it's it? official really yeah it's official, it's official. official? mark hamill already recorded Two weeks ago when he was playing oh. Koi, when he was like, nah, I certainly hope so on Twitter. Already in the can, son. Mark Hamill is the Joker in The Killing Joke. Alan Moore and Brian Boland's amazing story of Batman and the Joker. And kind of like the basically the origin of the Joker. Yeah. And one that's become sort of canon. It's not yeah. can official canon, but it's kind of like, look, if you're talking about the Joker and how he became the Joker, this is when he was in the Red and Hood how he gang. Thinks. And, yeah. How he processes yeah. things. Why uh, he is the Joker. This one for me, I, I, 
I don't know if it's officially come out. I think it's still rumor, but I love him voicing the Joker in Batman the Animated Series. That is my Joker. He's my Joker. Um, he called into Schmo's No one time, and it was like, he talks, and you're like, you just hear the Joker when mm -hmm. he talks. Even I know he's Luke Skywalker, but I'm like, he's just that voice is the Joker to me. And The Killing Joke is one of my all-time favorite comics ever um, because I think that it is something where it's like, he says that when he's describing his past and his history, it's like, well, I mean, what's true and what's not? Maybe I'm telling a story, maybe I'm not. Right. And kind of giving you that idea of he doesn't necessarily view what he's doing as wrong and showing Batman that anyone is two steps away from becoming a crazy killer like right. he is. Yeah. Um, so I think that having those two things combined, I mean, how could I not be excited about that? Um, to be clear, apparently it's not official yet. Um, there was a report. <laughs> we'll, just hang on. We'll see. I know that. I just mean it's not, not going saying, to happen. Well, yeah. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen. But remember, the, the definition of official is did Mark Hamill himself say it? Did the studio itself say it? Uh, as of right now, no. All right. Can I officially say that it's official? <laughs> <laughs> so far, there's a report going around. Somebody tweeted Mark Hamill saying they really hope he does the voice. And Mark Hamill tweeted back on, on his official Twitter handle, you're not the only one. Fingers crossed. Um, then, then another story came out saying sources close to it claim that Hamill has already recorded his voice acting. So this all, I, I believe this is true. I believe this is true. But for for you know for grammar, it's not official yet. Awesome. Yeah. Of course. Now I forget the name of the voice actor right now. Another, Kevin Conroy. Uh, no, the there's Batman? no the or? guy who's been replaced, who's been doing Joker in the animation stuff in oh, recent no. years. He has been doing a great job. Um, he's kind of got a little bit of Mark Hamill in there with a little bit of something else and has done very well for the stuff that I've seen. But Mark Hamill has done such a great job with the voice of the Joker and I think it just feels good knowing that it's him on the other side of that mm -hmm. microphone doing it. So I'm, I'm very happy about it. Yeah, and I, especially I, I want to see, because I, I believe Bruce Tim is helping shepherd in this version of The Killing Joke, if I'm not wrong. Mm. Is now, is that I I think, but I don't know that for sure either. But it's like it, they are, especially with, I mean, if you can see Justice League Gods and Monsters that Bruce Tim just did, Fantastic holy job. crap, yeah. it's awesome. It's incredible. It's so and good. It's a fresh take on all the characters, reinventing everybody, yeah. but still maintaining who they are. And so. I think it's something that, you know, DC has done a really incredible job of this kind of niche animation where it's like, okay, we're doing something that's darker. These are not kids animated right. films. Like, that is where it's like you hear the killing joke is going to be an animated film and you're like, oh, that's like, it's pretty like crazy, the stuff that happens in it. Mm. But DC does such a great job with them. So that's what excites me about it too. So definitely go online and check out any of those animated ones, specifically Gods and Monsters, because Bruce Tim is just yeah. fantastic. The other one that I can highly recommend is the adaptation of Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns. Mm -hmm. That's a two-parter and it's fantastic. I, I am not a big fan of the DC animated films. They cheap, they're just too cheap. They just won't put that money in that having done animation for 15 years, you need to put that money in in certain key scenes and they kind of like just chimp out and just ship it out. It's a problem I have with a lot of their animation. They didn't chimp though on The Dark Knight Returns and it shows. Yeah. Um, and they didn't on Gods and Monsters either, you know, and that's because Bruce Tim was in charge of yeah. it. So I know they were like had to squeeze a little bit of extra money out for Bruce Tim to make those scenes look really good. One of my good. favorite people to interview. Yeah. And uh, so I'm hoping that they do that with The Killing Joke, that they know that they've got something really special here and they honor it by not chimping out on the budget and like make sure it's really well animated. So that's my my hopes and, uh, you know, dreams for The Killing Joke to see it as an animated yeah. uh, movie. With Mark Hamill, I got the pleasure of working with him on Metalocalypse for eight years. And believe me, my first question to him, I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to ask him about Star Wars. I'm not going to. I didn't. I was like, man, I just got to say you were my favorite Joker. I had to get all nerd. <laughs> yeah. That had to be my first nerd boy yeah. question. So I'm severely hoping that he is going to be the Joker. So, and if you've not read The Killing Joke, do yourself a favor and go read it right now because it's Freaking amazing. That's right. The original writer, as he likes to call himself nowadays, Alan Moore <laughs> and Brian Boland. Check that book out, The Killing Joke. All right, let's move on and talk about Flashback. We're going to go right into Brad Bird's The Incredibles. So The Incredibles 2 has been announced. We're going to talk about one of the best superhero movies ever made, an original superhero movie from mm -hmm. Pixar in 2004. Brad Bird nailed the family superhero team, as well as making one of the best superhero films to ever be made. With the announced sequel, let's talk about The Incredibles and your memories of it. Oh my God. It's it's fantastic. <laughs> and it and it followed so true in that Pixar tradition. We talk about this all the time. 
Pixar does not make kid films. They make kid-friendly films. When you look at The Incredibles, it is such an adult movie. From start to finish, it is an adult movie whose main themes are targeted adults. Their jokes are targeted at adults. It's all about adults. It's about a middle-aged man yearning for the glory of his youth, struggling with what it is to have kids now, and maybe struggling after my own personal achievements while missing out on what's going on with the kids. It's about a mother who struggles with the absenteeism of the father and stuff like that, yet it's a loving family. They all love each other very much. There's a baby and all that kind of stuff. Then, you know, dealings with uh, issues of of hero worship and things like that and where that all leads with a great side character in Frozone in there with uh, Samuel Jack Jackson. I'm sorry, woman, where is my super suit? <laughs> I, I, one of the funniest moments in any Pixar movie ever. This movie had it all. Great humor, wonderful depth of characters. The action was terrific. You just bought into it. And a lot of people say it was truly what the Fantastic Four movies should have mm -hmm. been. Right. You could have called this Fantastic Four and changed things up a little bit. Yeah. It's such a spectacular movie. Today, I know a lot of people that still think in Incredibles is their all-time favorite Pixar film. While it's not mine personally, I can't make an argument against it. It's just that good. Yeah. Well, I think you it, there's something that Pixar does so well where you say it's an adult film that's kid-friendly. And I think that's why The Flash does so well, too, because it's something mm. where it's like kids can watch it and they get something awesome out of it and they connect to the characters. And there's definitely the coming of age story with the two younger siblings. I mean, I feel like I connected with Violet. The age old story of two siblings falling in love with each other. <laughs> you know, that, exactly. that age old story yeah. that we all can <laughs> understand. Yeah. What? Right? Um, but where it's like Violet's like awkward and kind of figuring out who she is and. Um, for her, it's like obviously dealing with the power that she has. But teenage right. girls go through that stuff all the time where it's like, how am I kind of growing into this adult woman where I'm not a kid anymore? And so there's so many themes that relate to everyone. And I think when you can sit in front of a movie with your whole family, with your grandma, your grandpa, whoever yeah. it is, and everyone's on board for it, and no one feels uncomfortable in any moment, that is magic where it's like, it's it's hard, hard work to do. And, and tell, totally tell me what you guys think it. of this. Violet was Aubrey Plaza before we knew who Aubrey Plaza was. There you go. Was, yeah. Wasn't that character yeah. basically Aubrey Plaza? Well, and they did, I feel like they do the very first like post credit scene with the baby. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was like one of the moments where you're like, oh my God. The Jack this, 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 yeah. And the Jack Attack little short special yeah. that yep. they did with us at Extra with the Blu-ray where he's yep. like, the you know, babysitter's having to deal with him like freaking That babysitter out. Yeah. thing was hilarious. Ooh, it was great. Yeah. Jack Jack was going to, along with the Fantastic Four now to think about it, Jack Jack was kind of like a, a, uh, a Franklin, Franklin Richards. Richards. Yeah. yeah character just say yeah done right so <laughs> yeah and also the subplot of like being illegal to be superheroes which they just you know whole whole took just took it from the Watchmen, yeah. which was fine yeah and a lot of other uh you know both marvel and dc have dealt with that whole yeah. issue of like you know outing superheroes and it's illegal to be a superhero now just the thing of being you know? different yeah and i love that the actually the super villain of the movie was somebody who idolized him as a, in the yeah. past and was like trying to be his sidekick and he's like look i don't have sidekicks yeah. and he became the super villain so once again if you haven't seen the incredibles do yourself a giant favor and check that movie out. It's incredible. <laughs> it really is. All right, we're going to move on to a section I call Spotlight. And this time we're going to talk about a superhero team or group. So we've got the Atomics this week. So Mike Allred is known by geeks not only as the creator of Madman, but also currently has a comic book turned TV show called I Zombie, mm -hmm. which is making its way into its second season. Let's look at his own creator-owned self-published comic called the, the Atomics that he did before his incredible run on the X-Force comic book series. Tiffany, let's start off with you. The Atomics. I, I just recently got to interview him. One of the coolest guys I've ever met, oh, where yeah. it's like he's very plugged into the art world. He's very plugged into the music world. Um, and so this series to me, I mean, they're called what the Mutant Beatniks or something. The team is <laughs> called that. Um, so you're like, he obviously has this indie kind of world where it's like, yeah. I'm going to pull other artistic things in. He's working on a new one, I think, for Vertigo soon. So nice. keep your eyes out for that. But he's just such a cool guy. And obviously the stuff with iZombie, everyone's on board for that now with the show coming out. Um, but I, I think this is such a cool new idea because it's almost like the butterfly story. Like mm. these characters are like the caterpillar where it's like they have boils and bad yeah. things happen and then they come into their superpowers. Yes. Which is really cool and interesting. Yeah, it's a really cool spin. And also just his art style is just evokes the 60s. Yeah. So I've always loved his art style. Is and this the, does his, did his wife work on this one with His him? wife colors all of yeah. his comics. Yeah. Laura Allred. Yep. And they're such a fantastic couple. They work together. Yeah. They do, they do these, these comics together. Yeah. I love everything he does. I love his specific style. It just reminds me of that 
perfect synthesis of like a Jack Kirby meets the Hernandez brothers. Yeah. It's this amazing, like it's got this flavory 60s style, but it's very up to date. So uh, this is, like I said, came out before X-Force. It's got a lot of really crazy, it's like the Doom <laughs> Patrol meets Fantastic Four meets the Avengers meets Justice League. And he just had fun just coming up with these yeah. amalgam characters. Just put it all together. Yeah, put them all in there. John, what did you think about the Atomic? I, the, you know, every week you put these things on and it, reminds me of like things I've read like oh my gosh I read two issues of that when I was I've never even heard of the Atomics so this is so like <laughs> it's over on me this oh, is right one on. I'd never even heard of before well, just, so when you mentioned that it was like self-published yeah. like well, that makes sense because I've, I've never even heard well of it. if you're like John and haven't seen it check it out it's worth checking mm -hmm. out it's called the Atomics it's in a collected trade paperback you can find it on any like Amazon or eBay but check out the Atomics that guy Mike Alred is He's on it. So yeah. we're going to get to Twitter questions right now. And starting with, we got Darth Odium <laughs> saying, uh, nice do you name. guys think we say Zod's corpse, we're going to see Zod's corpse in Batman v, this Va Batman v Superman trailer, that it's actually Bizarro and not Doomsday? What do you think? I, I think it's a, there's a very good reasons to think that way and to feel that way. I don't think that's the way they're going. I think it's simply a DNA swipe. I think they're going to take DNA to create something else. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it's I'm not going to die a shock if, if it turns out being more of a bizarro thing. Right. Uh, I definitely... I don't think it's going to be bizarro. I think it will be doomsday. And it's, you know, in the trailer, you see the woman walking next to the body, and right. it's Mercy Graves, who right. is directly connected with Lex Luthor. Oh, yeah. um, we did a whole breakdown on DC All Access, so if you want like more in-depth stuff on that. But I think that it's, let's take this corpse, let's take some DNA from it and inject it into something else, see what happens. And I think that's where I was talking about earlier with Lex, where he might look like this shiny, happy Silicon Valley guy, right. but he's working on some dark stuff under the surface. And when, because of how we learned about the Kryptonians in the um, in Man of Steel, where it's like they have specific things that they're geared towards, Doomsday is like hatred and destruction. So it's like, if you know that those are the only things he focuses on, it makes sense that it's going to come from a Kryptonian who had kind of that action, that darker it's a warmonger. Side. Yeah. Exactly. How well, cool would it be if in the next season premiere of Silicon Valley, if one of the potential, <laughs> a new potential backer for the guys comes along and it's Lex Luthor. That would oh. be awesome. Shared universe. That would be crazy. All right. Next question is Raul. He's got a question. What do you guys think of Thanos using the gauntlet to bring MCU's previous villains into the Infinity War? It solves them fighting dumb robots. That was like we talked about like the big Avengers movies. They always like, oh, they're fighting the Chitari, just a bunch of ants that get deactivated. Yeah. Then in Ultron, they're fighting a bunch of Ultrons yeah. that are like a bunch of ants that get deactivated. So we we're hoping that Infinity War, he's they're not gonna buy, fight a bunch of like baby Thanoses that get deactivated and they're all the power comes from the <laughs> Infinity Glove. It's like but that so, is the problem when you got a team like the Avengers is that cinematically you need cannon fodder for right. them. Mm -hmm. you, right. you need to have some kind of device in the movie that allows Captain America to see Captain America taking out eight whatever they are, to see the Hulk crushing 20 whatever they are, to see Thor smashing 15 whatever they are, right? right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of need cannon fodder, and that's what they did in those movies. So, okay, I still believe that Thanos has Red Skull because in Cap the original Captain America, we saw Red Skull get sucked in that same kind of vortex that we saw right. Loki fall into at the end of the first right. Thor, and he's fine. So I think we're going to see the return of the Red Skull. It just won't be the same actor, unfortunately. Um, no, he's not going to bring back the Dark Elf from the Dark World. I don't think that's going to happen. Maybe Ronan, but he didn't like Ronan, so I doubt it. Um, I don't know. I think we're going to see something new. I honestly do. I think we're going to see some kind of new device. Sure. I would hope something new, but also something not like a bunch of robots. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think there's something... You see everything get destroyed in Man of Steel, and everyone's like, oh my God, I can't believe that no one cares. He's killing all these people. Everything's evil. So it's like, if we do something different in this one, and it's characters that everyone's connected to, it's going to be like... Why are they killing everyone? Like, that's not what Marvel does. So right. I think that if they do bring in villains that maybe have already gone or that he brings them back, like you said, he didn't really care about Ronan. So fine, bring Ronan back and he's his, like, minion, you know? Because it ends up being that these ultra villains need minions to, like, kind of take the brunt of it. Right. They're the guys at the front and they take everything from the Avengers and then it's like, okay, now you finally get to the big bad. Um, so I would think it's cool if they kind of add to that and bring in some other villains, but I think you're always going to have to have that front line of like villain minions that have to go quickly. And totally. no, I'm not saying minions should be in the movie. Uh, or I'd bring it, I'd have them <laughs> the fight a bunch of minions. <laughs> Actually, a bunch Reality of minions. Reality altering yeah. gem, bring yeah. in the minions. All right. Here's our second to last question we've got from John. Which is worse, Superman 3 or Batman Forever? What do you think? What's worse? They're, okay, to be fair, 
let's be fair here. They are two different kinds of awful. They're both awful. I, wow. I actually, I can't believe I'm going to say this. I actually think Superman 3 is more unwatchable than Batman and Robin. I really Batman do. Batman Forever. Batman Forever, Batman Forever sorry. If it, was, if it was versus, oh, versus wait, Batman, Batman and Robin, I'd have a problem. Wait a second. Batman Forever. Batman Forever. So we're talking about the one Jim Carrey. Superman yeah. 3, yeah. It's Superman yeah. 3 oh. or Batman Forever. Superman 3 is worse. Yeah. Yeah, I have no problem saying that because I actually think there's some minor redeemable yes. cool qualities in Batman Forever. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. I think that Superman 3... Making it such a comedy was Ugh. really weird. Like, it didn't work for me at all. And prior in that, like, wasn't funny. Like, the funniest guy and wasn't funny in this one. So yeah. that, it was hard. And Batman Forever, though it was a little cartoony in a lot of ways, I'm like, I liked Jim Carrey in it. I liked Nicole Kidman in it. I am not opposed to Val Kilmer as Batman. I don't think he did a terrible job, especially in that universe. Oh, I agree. Batman. Um, so I still have fun watching that one. Superman three, I it's like yeah. even as a little kid, I'm like, so wait a minute, so they're the computer is wrapping up Superman in copper wiring, yeah, and it's, that's ho that's holding him down. Yeah. What? Yeah. It's horrible. <laughs> it's not Superman four Quest for Peace horrible, but it's pretty stinky. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I mean, I think the best part of Superman three is when he gets he fights himself and he's yeah. like drinking and he's all gets all purple. Uh, and he's like, I'm gonna have sex with this blonde. Your mother on the top doesn't of the understand. Statue of Liberty <laughs> and it's yeah, it's uh, that part of it I liked, but then the rest of it with like yeah, Richard Pryor. It was Richard Lester, the guy who took over or basically stole the movie from Richard Donner from Superman two. And you could see yeah. if you watch Superman two, you could see all the bad scenes that are directed by Richard Lester, and then you see an entire movie directed by Richard Saran Lester with Superman three. No. Um, right. Those are, you know, let's not even talk about that. <laughs> All right. So, hey, let's get to the super sweaty question of the week. And it's from Scott Lang. And it says, hey, John, love Collider Heroes. I'd love to see a movie about Franklin Richards. Uh, what do you think? Pros, cons? Guys, what do you think? Franklin Richards is the son of Sue Storm and, and, uh, and Reed, Reed Richards. Richards. And, and one of the focal points of the Onslaught storyline right? in the comic books, which crossed over a lot of the X-Men universe, where Onslaught was this kind of amalgamation of Magneto, the psionic oh, energy yeah. of Magneto and Professor, Professor Xavier came <laughs> right on the heels of Age of Apocalypse. And we were right. like, we just had Age of Apocalypse. How do we top Apocalypse? And they kind of came up with this creation. And now they're talking about X-Men and Fantastic Four doing a team-up movie. Brian Singer's right. talking mm -hmm. about that, which brings in Franklin Richards being the key. What do you guys think? He was almost messianic in some ways. Like All the bad guys Guys wanted him, all the good guys wanted him, and he was just a kid. It really depends on how this universe unfolds. Look, I'll be honest with you. Right now, the Fantastic Four and the X-Men universes, as they stand, it doesn't feel like a Franklin Richards, the way we understand Franklin Richards, would really fit in there necessarily. I, I'll be honest with you. Let's just, we've got the Fantastic Four babies starting off. Let's, let's take a breath and worry about maybe a Franklin Richards five, ten years from now. Right now, I'm not really interested in it. I feel like we're about to go on our first date with the Fantastic Four, and you're like, do you want to get married and have babies? Like, right. Should we pick out carpets? Most, right. <laughs> like, Come let's on. move in together. It's the most, like, right. jarring, because we don't know what this movie's going to be like. I don't know who these characters are yet. I mean, I'm assuming that there's going to be some connection between Mr. Fantastic and the Invisible Woman, but right. I don't know that for a fact, so getting to this character seems a ways off to me. Let's just like go on a couple dates and see yeah. what happens. I say Franklin Richards, <laughs> Fantastic Four 3. And that's all I've got to say about this. Thanks for watching <laughs> Heroes episode 19. Tiffany Smith, where can we find you online? Um, you guys can find me on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, at Tiffany's Tweets. You can see me on DC All Access and then on Fandango Movie Clips. Just started a new show with Christian Harloff called Movie Threesome, so check that out. Oh, and Far, Far Away, my Star Wars podcast. Awesomeness. John, where can people find you? You guys can find me on all the social media outlets, simply on Facebook or on Twitter, just at John Camby. And of course, Monday through Friday on Movie Talk. And you guys can find me here next week on Heroes episode 20 and also on Movie Talk with John at Collider Video. Make sure you subscribe to Collider Video when you're watching this. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. You can get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, at www.tdoslwh. You can get a digital download or buy a Blu-ray and help support independent film. I'll see you guys next week.